So for the next video, we're going to explore the allegations made by Esme Bianco. And for those who are not familiar, she is Roz from the Game of Thrones series. Before we go into her allegations, I would just like to point out what the Phoenix Act is and a specific point in the Phoenix Act that is relevant to the allegations made against Marilyn Manson. So I went and looked on the Phoenix Act website to read more about it and there's not a lot of information there. There's some survivor stories but essentially uh, what I did find was, you know, what what the Phoenix Act actually is and it's a PowerPoint type presentation and um, so we'll just read through that. One of the things I'd like to point out here is that I fully support everything that this Phoenix Act is representing but there's a specific point on here that I think is relevant to Manson so uh, let's just read through it. I also think that people should be supporting this to be brought in in each state. Um, it makes some very good points that I completely and 100% wholeheartedly agree with. It's a good cause. It starts out, it's not about harsher, punish, harsher punishments for perpetrators, it's about giving more rights to victims. I think harsher punishments, personally, I think harsher punishments are necessary, but I also agree that giving more rights to victims is absolutely the way to go. The current problem is the statute of limitations. The statute of limitation laws vary from state to state. Statute of limitation laws establish the window of time to prosecute an alleged perpetrator of a crime and they vary by state and they do here in Australia as well incidentally. In most states, for example California, the statute of limitation for cases of domestic violence in criminal cases is two to four years. That means that the state can file a lawsuit against the accused on behalf of the victim two to four years after an event. In the case of a civil suit, the victim must file a case within three years of the alleged assault. As per California's current statute of limitation law, even if the state has DNA or multiple pieces of evidence that undeniably prove guilt, no case can be brought forward if it is not prosecuted within two, the two to four year window. I totally agree, that stinks. A large number of survivors fear for their lives due to threats and coercion from their per perpetrators which can cause a victim to wait years until they feel safe enough to come forward. This includes fear of dismissal, arrest or losing their children by reporting their attacks to police. Numerous victims with PTSD develop symptoms within three months of the traumatic event. However, some people won't notice their symptoms until years after, when many survivors can no longer seek justice. I agree, all of that is true and an awful state of affairs. So the Phoenix Act proposes a solution. The statute of limitation exceptions. Under specific circumstances, there should be exceptions to the statute of limitations for domestic violence crimes when one of the following circumstances is present. Uh, this is their proposal, by the way, and I'm just surprised that it wasn't already in place, but the state first discovers DNA evidence sufficient to charge the perpetrator. The state first becomes aware of the existence of an audio or recording, photographs or written or electronic communication that provides evidence sufficient to charge the perpetrator. A person confesses to the offence. And the last bullet point, which is the one I want to focus on, three or more victims present other evidence against the same perpetrator. What we discovered was that at the time Evan Rachel Wood was bringing this to the Senate, there was only her making these allegations against Manson. And then Esme Bianco joined the chorus. Now, I support women with voices like actresses coming forward and lending their voices to the voiceless. I completely support that. I think Rose McGowan has been a powerhouse for women in coming forward and expressing the empowerment that it can bring. And I think Rose McGowan has done things the right way. Like she has not brought false allegations against anyone to support her cause. She had real allegations, she had real issues. And I completely support her lending her voice to that. She has a community voice that 
not many victims have. I believe Evan Rachel Wood and Esme Bianco also have that power. However, I believe in this case they've misused it and it comes down to this bullet point number four here that three or more victims present other evidence against the same perpetrator. So the allegations that Evan had made against Manson were dismissed by the court because they fell outside the limita statute of limitations and um, had her allegations been real, I, I would have shared her dismay over that. However, there is evidence to show that these are not uh, genuine allegations as is the case with Rose McGowan. Um, and the same goes for Esme Bianco. Um, hers is slightly, even though she's making the same allegations, she went about hers a little bit differently. Uh, even though she was involved with uh, putting this to the Senate, she kind of went about things a little bit differently. So we'll get into her case in a minute. Essentially, this is what the Phoenix Act has brought forward. I think it's close to 11 states in the US now have, have accepted these extending the statute of limitations um, and that's a great thing for women um, and abused victims um, but it needs to be you know equal we need to have a perpetrator that is a human it can't be just a perpetrator is only ever a man it needs to be a perpetrator of any kind of violence it needs to be held to account there's no exceptions so um I'd just like to point that out, that that's my position on all of this as a whole. Now, to move on to Esme Bianco's allegations. My name is Esme Bianco, I'm a domestic violence survivor and advocate. Before he succeeded in his seduction, my abuser carefully groomed me, manipulating and gaslighting me over a number of years of friendship. He knew that I was easy prey. I had neither power nor control over my life. A previous intimate relationship had stripped me of both, and so I was led from the frying pan into the fire. Initially, he was charming, intelligent, funny. He told me I was his soulmate. By the time I was living with him, he controlled every aspect of my life. He had a dress code I was expected to abide by. He controlled what I ate, decided if my friendships were acceptable, and when I called my family, I, do, I did so hiding inside a closet. I was not allowed to key to the house, and I would often be locked in the bedroom. He controlled when and if I slept, and I was often violently shaken awake should I go to sleep without permission. Verbal abuse and name-calling was a daily occurrence, but the physical violence was most often disguised in acts of intimacy and was not consented to. In one instance, I was bitten until my body was covered in bruises, on another occasion cut with a knife during sex. He took photos of my naked, mutilated body and posted them online without my knowledge. I still have these photos along with photos of my body covered in welts and inflicted with a whip. On one occasion, after four days of no sleep, he became very angry with me. He started smashing holes in the walls with an axe, and as I tried to calm him down, he began to chase after me with a weapon. It was at this stage I realized my life was in danger. I was a prisoner in his hell, and yet I thought I had done something to deserve this, so I just tried harder to please him. My trauma had normalized these horrific events to enable me to survive. It took me seven years to get to the stage where I could see these acts for what they were, domestic violence. After a diagnosis of PTSD, the symptoms of which I still suffer on a daily basis, I started the incredibly painful process of healing from my trauma. The night terrors are the worst part. I wake from these dreams screaming, soaked in sweat, sweat mid-panic attack, and once the panic subsides, it is replaced with a crippling shame. The shame is overwhelming. The fear that I might somehow repeat past patterns and find myself back in the cycle. When I finally found the courage seven years later to seek legal advice, I was told, despite having photographic, video, and written evidence, that it was too late. Nothing could be done. So I live. So I live with the daily knowledge that my abuser is still inflicting irreparable damage on other women. The Phoenix Act gives survivors the time they need to break the cycle for both themselves and their abusers, who we know are statistically most likely to continue abusing if left unchecked. I know I will never see justice for what happened to me, but I am here risking my safety and that of my family to respectfully ask you to vote yes on this bill and give thousands of survivors a chance to seek the justice they deserve. Thank you. Just like Evan Rachel Wood and Amber Heard, the accusers would have you believe that they are these angelic, almost perfect humans 
who have no past. But we know that this is completely unrealistic, like all humans are imperfect. We all have a past, we were all teenagers once, we all made stupid mistakes, including dating someone that we might later feel a little bit embarrassed about. I would argue that these little mistakes and embarrassments are the character building exercises that lead to who we are as adults. They are the very things that help us to grasp the concepts of our moral existence and help us to identify the rights from wrongs in life. I would suggest, and you can take it or leave it, but I would suggest to embrace your past, to accept that that's how you learn certain things about life. Don't let anybody embarrass you, particularly the mainstream media, who currently think it's just a great laugh to have a go at men who have erectile dysfunction claiming that it makes them angry and somehow therefore abusive, which just gives you a very good idea of how quickly their own morals will flip just depending on the salaciousness of a headline. I would say reject what perfection is supposed to look like and just be a bloody human. It takes far less effort to simply be a genuine human being than to do what these women are doing and that is projecting themselves as victims when in fact they were just quite simply starstruck teens. I wanted to add this clip so that you can get a sense of what Esme Bianco behaves like when she's just normally being herself or shooting the breeze, as it were. But she also says something that I find extremely interesting about playing the character of Roz. Uh, so let's just have a listen. It actually wasn't that long a day, but it felt long because I had prosthetics before we started shooting. And then being on set, and having to hold that position of, you know, hanging from my wrists and not being able to move is really taxing. So that day was tough. Of all of the people to kill me, the fact that Joffrey killed me is seriously not okay. <laughs> and they wouldn't let me die on screen as well, which I was a little... I said, can I not just be having the last, like... <laughs> and they said, no. What are you doing? Going to King's Landing. In a turnip cart? I'll find a ship heading south in White Harbour. You know, the thing I've always loved about her character is that she's one of the very few small folk. And, you know, she came from these really humble beginnings and worked very hard to better herself, but she never had any aspirations of power or royalty. She just wanted to create a good life for herself. And if anyone was to remember anything, I hope it would be seeing a woman who's just trying to empower herself in a way that's not hurting everyone around her. Interesting, right? I mean, one of the things that I would advise people who haven't seen Game of Thrones is not to get attached to any particular character. It's what I was advised, and it was good advice because <laughs> the whole series from start to end is pretty much the destruction of every single character in the entire story, no matter whether they're likeable or not. Nonetheless, I find it very interesting that the quality that she liked about Roz was that Roz was just getting along trying to look after herself whilst not hurting other people around her. As we get further into Esme's allegations, we will discover that that's not entirely the way that she herself would behave. In fact, in one of her most recent court filings, it does look like she's trying to lash out at Manson for what might appear to be her own failures. In this interview that she gave with, uh, to the Rolling Stones in April, which is just before the Depp trial kicked off, she claims that Manson flipped out when he found out that he, she would be on tour with the Deftones. If he was involved with that tour, I cannot blame him for flipping out about that. That doesn't mean he's trying to destroy her career. It means that she's trying to destroy his and he's involved with that tour. He can't be around someone who is making these types of allegations. It just stands to reason that 
he would be upset about that. The article reads, Esme Bianco, Marilyn Manson's ex-girlfriend, who is suing the singer for SA and human trafficking, among other charges, has expanded her allegations against the singer, claiming that he interfered with her involvement in a planned tour video for Deftones. According to a motion filed Wednesday in the United States District Court for the Central District of California, Bianco participated in a video shoot to be used as part of the stage set for the band's current tour. The trek kicked off this month and is scheduled to go through to July. In exchange for providing her images, the legal filing alleges Ms Bianco expected an economic benefit from significant public exposure by the band's worldwide tour and the opportunity to continue working with the highly sought after creative director who oversaw the project. Bianco's motion claims that Manson, whose real name is Brian Warner, found out about her involvement in the project and contacted the band to confront them over the Deftones' decision to work with Miss Bianco. Bianco claims to Rolling Stone that she heard Warner flipped out and was having a complete meltdown about the fact that I was working with the Deftones and they decided to cut my footage. What it doesn't mention here is what Marilyn Manson has to do with that particular tour. There has been very little information that's come out about it, but I expect that to come out eventually, that he was somehow also involved. The British actress who played Roz on Game of Thrones was one of more than a dozen women to speak out against the shock rocker last year. I don't know that there was more than a dozen. I get five all up. I don't get more than a dozen, so I don't know where that information came from. In February 2021, she detailed the alleged abuse she suffered during a relationship with Warner when they were a couple in 2011. In April 2021, Bianco sued Warner, claiming in her lawsuit that Warner used drugs, force and threats of force to coerce sexual acts from Miss Bianco on multiple occasions. Her lawsuit went on to allege that Warner committed sexual acts with Bianco at times when she was unconscious or unable to consent. According to a statement from his attorney last year, Warner vehemently denies any claims of sexual assault or abuse of anyone. Warner has previously dismissed each and every allegation from Bianco as untrue and meritless, claiming in court filings that the fabricated accounts of abuse against him a part of a coordinated attack by former partners and associates of Mr Warner who have weaponized the otherwise mundane details of his personal life and their consensual relationships. In the new motion, Bianco claims that Warner, who remains under active investigation by the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department for allegations of domestic violence between 2009 and 2011, but has not faced any criminal charges, used his power and influence in the entertainment industry to interfere with Miss Bianco's ability to continue working with the Deftones. Defended Warner's actions were intended to cause the contract with Miss Bianco to be breached by Deftones when they refused to utilise her images, she alleges in her filing. I would say if, he, if she had a contract, then she should be taking this up with the Deftones. Uh, that would be my guess as to, you know, the proper legal action to take. The video has not been used on the group's tour. Bianco claims the alleged breach resulted in reputational damage and loss of future economic opportunity with Deftones and according to the filing, Warner committed an independently wrongful act that was designed to disrupt the relationship between Bianco and the group. Bianco tells Rolling Stone she believes the consensus had been reached that it was easier to cut me than to deal with Brian. Someone in Deftone's camp decided to scrap me because of Brian calling them. I would say if it came down to a choice of who they wanted involved with their tour project, it was probably going to be Marilyn Manson. Neither Deftones as a whole nor any individuals connected to the group, which includes former Marilyn Manson bassist Fred Sablan, as a touring member, were added as defendants in the suit. A rep for the band and their management, Velvet Hammer, declined to comment. In the new filing, her lawyer argued that Warner's alleged interference 
is a recent continuation of his efforts to silence Miss Bianco through threats, intimidation and coercion. By continuing to threaten my career opportunities, Warner again demonstrates that even amidst criminal investigation and civil litigation, he will stop at nothing in attempt to silence his victims, Bianco tells the Rolling Stones. The complicity of those who enable these intimidation tactics demonstrates why survivors are so hesitant to come forward. If those who hold power to stand up to abusers choose not to, survivors will stand alone. This is further evidence of Mr Warner's continued attempts to intimidate Ms Bianco into silence, adds J. L. Wenger, the attorney representing Bianco and Ashley Morgan Smith Klein, who is also suing Warner for SA and human trafficking, among other charges. The threats and coercion must stop, and our hope is that today's filing will help inform Mr Warner that there will be consequences for his actions. As detailed in Rolling Stone's investigation into the rocker last November, Bianca claims Warner began love bombing her shortly after they met. Their relationship, according to Bianca's suit, included a nightmarish pattern of drugs, constant monitoring, physical abuse, and SA. She would later become a prominent advocate for survivors of SA, working with Evan Rachel Wood to create the Phoenix Act which extends the statute of limitations for DV survivors to pursue charges against their abusers. When it comes to the criminal justice system, survivors have practically no control over the process, Bianco said, and I fully intend to pursue every avenue I have because that's how I take my agency back. I am standing up and saying, no, you don't get to just walk away from that. Again, I would say that there is obviously more to this story um, and I would say that if Manson was actually involved with this Deftones tour in some way, even either creatively or whatever, that he has every right to be upset that the very woman accusing him of things wants to um, be on that tour. He absolutely has to by all legal remedy stay away from her until these court filings have been dealt with which brings me to the latest salacious headlines that the media seem to be running with coming from the unsealed documents from the Depp versus Heard case which by their account would have us believe that Depp and Manson were involved in some kind of collusion regarding their accusers. They claim unsealed court documents have exposed crude texts Depp sent disgraced rocker Marilyn Manson, which were excluded from his trial against Amber Heard. Missing texts, <laughs> obviously they weren't missing because they're in the evidence, Nude photos and Russian bots are among explosive claims exposed in previously locked documents from Johnny Depp's defamation trial against Amber Heard. Well, <laughs> that's a little bit misleading because what they exposed was what Amber's legal team were presenting to the judge and that doesn't mean it was true or fact or even entered into evidence. It was just discussed during their trial negotiations. I believe they are called motions in limine, which means limited what are they going to limit during the trial? Anyway, over the weekend, documents seen by Daily Beast, and I'm not giving them any clicks, obviously, because they have completely misconstrued what is in those documents, containing pages of evidence excluded from the trial that gripped the world, were unsealed, providing new insight into Depp's hotshot legal team strategy. And it doesn't reflect too well on Team Depp, I would argue. It doesn't reflect too well on Team Amber or the media. It comes as Heard filed to appeal the jury verdict, ordering her to pay Johnny Depp 14.5 million, or 10 US million, in damages after the court found she had defamed him in her 2018 Washington Post opinion on being a victim of DV claims Depp wanted to submit new photos. Well, that's not what it claims. What the actual paperwork says is that if Amber Heard wants to keep pushing it, he will indeed submit those photos as evidence that she did not have bruises on particular days. Anyway, moving on. 
any references to and evidence regarding Marilyn Manson was removed from trial with Depp's team arguing it would smear Mr. Depp under a guilty by association theory. Which is true, that's why it was removed. Manson's former partner, Evan Rachel Wood, has made several allegations of SA against the goth rocker, including that he forced her to have sex while filming one of his music videos. We'll get into that one next. Included elsewhere in the documents were text messages between Depp and Manson, born Brian Warner, in which the two men shared insults of her. <laughs> I don't even know that they shared insults. In a 2016 text, Manson allegedly wrote, I got an amber 2.0, and also Lindsay just pulled an amber on me. So neither of those are insulting Amber Heard directly, other than calling her out for false allegations. But we'll get into that. I've got the text. So Depp responds, I've been reading a lot of material on that and sociopathic behavior. It is effing real, my brother. My ex, C, <laughs> is goddamn textbook, according to the document. Again, we'll get to those texts and the context, because you can't remove the context. You can't just take this little sentence and then remove all of the context. So we'll look at those next. Then Manson, in an apparent reference to an incident where the police were called to Depp and Heard's shared Los Angeles apartment in 2016, wrote, I got a serious police amber type scenario with Elle's family. I'm effing stressing. I don't know if you are back, but I need asylum somewhere because I think the cops might be headed my way. The filing states, Heard's lawyers alleged that Depp and Manson went on drug binges together including in the days before the actress arrived in Australia and the two got in a now infamous fight that ended with the actor losing the tip of his middle finger. Well, at least they admit that much. Johnny Depp has been close friends with Manson for almost three decades. So there you go, that's what they are alleging these text messages actually say about Depp and his collusion with Marilyn Manson. Before we get into the text themselves, I just want you, yourself, if you were one of the people who watched the trial from start to end for the entire six or seven weeks, if you think that any of these messages, taken out of context, as Paul Bettany's were, would have made any difference whatsoever to the outcome of the trial. So... This is a website called Marilyn Manson Uncancelled um, and they go through these texts in quite some detail. It's called an annotated examination of the unsealed text exchange between Marilyn Manson and Johnny Depp. What follows is a commentary on the unsealed text exchange between Marilyn Manson and Johnny Depp in order to offer a better and clearer understanding of what is going on instead of the false reports in the media. They were part of the plaintiff's trial exhibit in the Johnny Depp vs Amber Heard trial. The owner seems to have been the sister of Johnny Depp, Christy Dombrowski, and Johnny Depp himself. The texts revolve around the period from June 23rd, 2016 to November 4th, 2017. During this time, Marilyn Manson and Johnny Depp were collaborating on music and music videos while also supporting each other in their troubled relationships. Marilyn Manson's girlfriend, Lindsay Usich, and Johnny Depp's wife, Amber Heard, besides their own separate projects. It is impossible to accurately interpret these texts unless you get as much context as possible, and that is what I will attempt to provide below. The exchange begins on June 23rd, 2016 at 12.08am, so just after midnight. Marilyn Manson's checking in with Johnny Depp to see if things are alright. This was around the time Amber Heard was getting a restraining order against Johnny Depp. There is a gap and Depp doesn't respond, but at 9.08am Manson hopes he had slept well. Depp didn't read the messages until 3.47pm. I'll just leave those images up there so you can see them. They're not, um, it's very typical of Elaine's submissions. They're not legible. The same day on the 
on June 23rd at 11.01 a.m., Marilyn Manson sends Johnny Depp two attachments that we can't make out, along with a message that says, I got an Amber 2.0. The Amber he refers to is likely Amber Heard. While Manson himself does not reveal in the text, we have who Amber 2.0 is. Therefore, we can only assume it is his girlfriend at the time, uh, Lindsay, though it is possible it could be a reference to another woman from that time. Since during this time, Manson and Usich were having a rough time in their relationship and Manson was reportedly seeing other women. Nonetheless, he is likening her actions to what Amber Heard was doing to Depp at the time. We should also note that on June 23, 2016, Manson was on tour and was likely texting from Texas. So if it was Lindsay he was talking about, he wasn't home at the time in Los Angeles. For all we know, it could refer to Evan Rachel Wood, since it was on June the 10th of 2016 that she came out as a victim of DV for the first time without naming Marilyn Manson. So let's zoom in on this because <laughs> poop deck pappy, we are going to smooth up soon. Yay. <laughs> I think I know what he means by poop deck pappy. <laughs> I am bus. I think that means I am on a bus. Just going, well on the bus. Just going through the border of US and Canada. I'll be in jail soon. Love you motherfucker. What? song should I play with you and what song should you play with us Canada the worst so we're now reading a text Manson sent to Depp on June the 8th 2016 at 10 a.m. he calls him poop deck pappy poop deck pappy is the name of Popeye's father from the Popeye cartoon Popeye and poop deck pappy are known for being a spitting image of one another though pappy has a white beard Smooth up could have a variety of meanings from getting rid of any irregularities in their life to shaving so we can only speculate what is meant. At 10.50pm on the same day, Depp texts Manson and tells him he's on a bus crossing the border between the US and Canada and jokes that he will be in jail soon in a humorous reference probably to the smuggling of his dogs by Amber in Australia a year earlier. He also expresses his love for Manson and asks him what two songs they should play together on stage. Manson's first response, more than an hour later, is in reference to either Canada itself or the experience of crossing the Canadian border. Manson himself was in Hartford, Connecticut at the time playing a gig with Slipknot. I was at this concert by the way. Um, so we'll just zoom in. My new fan meet and greet girl. Looks like you need it. Trust me. I'll send a pic. 18 with you guys. Debt. Show with me. Um, I'm going to assume, as most of us have, that many of these texts were purposely uh, redacted. And so they are illegible. Uh, which is what that bottom text is. Manson's second response a minute later could be interpreted as him trying to hook his friend up with the girl who was running his concert meet and greets looks like you need it could be a response by man manson to a photo Depp sent of himself probably in a bored mood for having to wait at the border crossing manson's third response is in reference to Depp's question as to what songs they would perform together the first is alice cooper's i'm 18 that he wants to perform with the hollywood vampires while separately with his band he wants to perform with Depp, the dope show Whenever performing The Dope Show together, Manson would commonly retitle it as The Depp Show, as can be seen here. In the next text at 5.26am on July 9th is obscure, but I can, I can make out the name Lindsay and I am having my friend take her to... The same day at 5.17pm, Depp replies, it's difficult to interpret the first few words outside of its context. Manson was in New Jersey at the time on tour. The two photos Manson sent him to be of Manson himself, though it is not clear. We shall exchange precious bodily fluids. It's just part of Manson and Depp 
using gay references to refer to each other's close friendship and should not be interpreted literally. Let's have a closer look. In and in and out. Loving Jew, my brother. I awoke to two lovely photos of a man that seems to be capturing more than my attention. Thank you for remembering. These little tokens keep my heart warm in your absence. I miss you, my brother. We shall exchange precious bodily fluids. Don't take no shit. Most important is to stay calm and not give her what she wants, which is to make you scream, flip out and feed her narcissism. Trust me, I've been reading a lot of material on that and the sociopathic behaviour. Big gay love, zippy the pinhead. <laughs> they have a lot of references to creative things. I mean, uh, just as Paul Bettany and Depp's texts were talking about um, movies that Paul, uh, uh, Paul had actually performed in himself, um, there are these similar exchanges that go on between Depp and Manson. Okay, these references refer to each other's close, refer close friendship and should not be interpreted literally. They have done this for many years, publicly and privately, and have showed their affection for one another by playing with this type of language in a joking manner, as he does at the end of this tax when he bids farewell, saying, Be gay love. Johnny seems to be then advising Manson on how to deal with the situation with Lindsay, if it is the Lindsay that he's referring to. We are not told the context. He wisely advises Manson to stay calm and not scream or flip out. This is something Depp apparently learned in his readings on the subject of dealing with a narcissist, which like refers to Amber Heard. He calls Amber his ex C and textbook example of being a sociopath. Depp then tells Manson he has to go on stage to perform. Zippy the Pinhead is a reference to another comic strip character who is known for his enthusiasm for philosophical non sequiturs, verbal free association, and the pursuit of popular culture eph ephemera. His wholehearted devotion to random artifacts satirizes the excesses of consumerism. Surprise, surprise that Depp and Manson are both into this type of philosophical non sequiturs. <laughs> We are awesome. I'm going to play Tom Wally Wallet. Three songs and get straight paid. You and me and the dingus makes three. Far out. Is Joe okay? Let me know as soon as you can. The first text from July 9th, 2016 at 5.49pm seems to lack a lot of context. Tom Wally is the head of Manson's label Loma Vista. Wally is the former chairman and CEO of Warner Brothers Records, who also worked with Manson during his time at Interscope in the 90s. Apparently Manson is talking about playing a private gig for him. Wallet seems to be Manson's habit of wordplay on the name Wally and the fact that he gets paid by him. I don't know who the dingus is, though on Instagram Manson refers to actor Billy Zane as Carpe Dingus. While the sentence itself is a reference to Manson's song called You and Me and the Devil Makes Three. The second text is a reference to Aerosmith and Hollywood Vampires guitarist Joe Perry, who on the night of his text while playing on stage, collapsed just two songs into the concert. Manson was asking Depp to inform him of his condition. Depp replies to Manson six minutes later and informs him that Joe Perry is okay and in a stable condition and describes how frightening the experience was to see. A minute later, Manson replies to Depp in a friendly and caring way, informs him that he wants that if he wants to talk, he could talk to him since he was on his bus, likely going from Pennsylvania to his next gig in Ohio. After some scrambled texts, Manson talks about how they are both having a fucked up year and he expresses that they should both join forces and change it, adding a reference to the well-known Saturday morning cartoon, The Wonder Twins, who would both touch each other's rings and say, Wonder Twins powers activate whenever they wanted to activate their superpowers. 
that text, those texts read, Hey, you up? I need to crash with you if I can. I'm coming to the fuck pad tonight. Tight pants. <laughs> okay, this is a different set of texts. With the previous set of texts. Um, this is the next set that we're going to discuss. Hey yo, I'm gonna hobo spank you. Had a massive dramatic exodus of the it, but I'm okay, can't sleep, just wanted to hear from my not gay boy. We now move forward to November 19, 2016, when at 4.59 a.m. Manson tries to get in touch with Depp in order to crash at his house for the night. He tries again at 8.05 a.m. but seems to get no response. The next day at 7.43 a.m. Manson reveals he had some sort of massive dramatic exodus of the it and that he was okay. Whatever this means, it seems to have stressed Manson out or worked him up and he just wanted to talk to someone but Depp doesn't reply. Seems like Manson still couldn't get in touch with Depp on November 21st. During this time, Manson is no longer on tour and seems like he's in Los Angeles. Again, we have garbled text. Um, and I'm presuming that Judge Azkarate did say that there were certain things that would never come out because they were about other people that were nothing to do with this. And of course, you know, Manson's breakup with his women folk had nothing to do with whether or not uh, Amber defamed Depp. Uh, so Depp replies, I send Starling right now. On November 25th, 2016, 8.43pm, Manson sent Depp a message and the only words I can make out are fuck, asylum and know if you can talk. There seems to be some urgency from Depp's next reply. Depp replies at 9.20 that he is sending him Starling Jenkins, Depp's driver and bodyguard, and asks Manson if he should send him at that moment. you back I'm at Bates but Lindsay pulled an amber and she filed a police report because that zipper head James and her poor fat mum who steal who want to steal my money fuck them I am safe right now but I may need to hide out if you got a spare room let me know brother I will so it's interesting that these tax exchanges between Depp and Manson about Lindsay have not offended Lindsay. Lindsay's not taking these offensively. She knows they had a rough time during that period. She accepts that he probably did talk to Depp about stupid things and express his frustration or whatever because uh, she's still married to him and she's still standing by him right now to this day. At 9.22pm, Manson replies by saying that he is at the house of Tyler Bates, where he would go at this time to record his new album. Here we see a definite link Manson is making between Lindsay and Amber by saying that Lindsay pulled an Amber in, a, in filing a police report. According to Manson, musician James Iyer, the husband of Ashley Usage, Lindsay's twin sister, and Lindsay's mother were out to steal his money. We have no other information about this accusation, though we do know now that a police report was in fact never filed. Whatever the case, Depp is ready to lend Manson any support and help he needs, but Manson tells him he felt safe for now. Just to add to that, the lawyer who obtained all of the documents after they were unsealed and released them on, on the internet for all of us to look at, she actually went looking for these police reports that Manson was talking about and there, there weren't any. Now, there may be police interactions that they will never reveal, but as far as any charges or anything that, was, uh, that Manson was charged with, anything that came of it, there is nothing there. There is no court documents, there's nothing. So Marilyn Manson says, thanks man. Depp says, always, stay away from her. Give her no chance to get at you. Which <laughs> Marilyn Manson didn't follow that advice because, as I said, he is married to her now. Depp again advises Manson to stay away from Lindsay, fearing that Lindsay may do to Manson what Amber did to him. And that's exactly what these te text messages read. They're not direct insults at Amber Heard in the same vein as... Paul Bettany and Johnny Depp texts were read out in the trial. These are quite literally Manson commiserating with 
Depp because both their girlfriends were doing the same false allegations. You get no other context from this. But these two guys are on the same page that these are false allegations. An hour later, Manson replies that he hopes the police don't come after him. By this time, he has managed to go over to the home of Tyler Bates again to work on the last track of his album. Though there is room for one more track, he asks Depp when he will be in LA. El Hombre Negro is translated as the black man. Manson isn't Spanish, so we should allow for the fact that he may say something wrong. It could be the name of a place or person, or a name Manson gave himself or Depp. If I were to guess, this is probably an, a reference to a segment in one of Manson's favourite shows that he also appeared in, Eastbound and Down, where Kenny Powers learns the word for black in Spanish is Negro, and therefore calls himself the Negro Hombre, since he always wears black, even though it is grammatically incorrect. And there's the text. It is Marilyn Manson. I'm hoping that the popo ain't coming after me. I'm at Bates, finishing the last track, hopefully, but there is room for more. When are you in El Hombre Negro? So the next text is... Kooky Kitty, indeed, this is from uh, Johnny Depp. Let us dine and quench our thirst, my brother. This is my opinion that we will need a cave of some sort. I'm thinking de Sade style. E. <laughs> Miss you and I'm here whenever. Love you long time, Jimmy Drip. <laughs> they have a lot of nicknames for each other but it's good to see the bromance between the two guys that they're not embarrassed to express their feelings for each other they're not um, embarrassed to express love for one another that other people might think could come across as gay they seem to embrace the gayness of their relationship so I don't get any homophobe vibes in there um, although I do know that both men are straight. I'll text you tomorrow, Marilyn Manson replies. Let's have our own salo. But no gay stuff with us. Just get the guy in front of the Chinese theatre and someone from any goth band and buy them as slaves and make them recreate our formative years in an opera. <laughs> A street opera. And we shall tussle the young lassies Double Dots Girl gets here on Thursday. We can have clandestine man times. <laughs> Cat wrestling. Then the Fanta shall send us into out her space space boom trademark. <laughs> oh my goodness. It's, quite, it's very creative in this zany kind of way that Depp and his friends actually are. Out her face space is not actually referring to anybody in particular. He's talking about outer space. Uh, I think that that's quite hilarious. But anyway, we'll see what this person interpreted all of that as. At 2.33 a.m. on Monday the 26th, Depp writes Kooky Kitty, which may be a reference to Lindsay or even Manson, but it isn't clear. Depp tells Manson that he is indeed in Los Angeles and that they should drink and eat together. Seeing that Manson was talking to him about the album in the previous text and that Johnny Depp would eventually appear in two music videos for two songs on this album, it seems likely that they begin to exchange ideas about one of the music videos that would eventually become the video for the song Kill For Me. The other video is for Say 10, which contains similar imagery. Perhaps they were discussing even another video that never came to fruition. Nonetheless, Depp here suggests they use a cape of some sort for the video and make it styled after something by the Marquis de Sade. He then tells Manson that he is up to getting together for whatever he wants. Love you long time is a famous line used by a prostitute when propositioning a pair of American soldiers in the film Full Metal Jacket. Roughly translated, it means I will satisfy your sexual desires, but here Depp is probably just using it in a joking reference, which is the way it is often used in pop culture. Unclear about the Jimmy Drip reference, Manson replies a few hours later at 5.06am that he will text Depp tomorrow about getting together. 
He then agrees with Depp's music video idea by referencing Salo as an inspiration. Salo is a Pasolini film based on the unfinished novel 120 Days of Sodom by the Marquis di Sade. The film focuses on four wealthy corrupt Italian libertines in the time of the fantastic Republic of Salo. There you go, I did not know that. The libertines kidnap 18 teenagers and subject them to four months of extreme violence, sadism and sexual and psychological torture. Solo has long been an influence on Manson's art and has been recommended by him for many years and now it seems he finally wants to do a music video influenced by Solo with Depp. This video would eventually be kill for me and although they like to make gay jokes about their friendship, Manson makes it clear that they're is to be no gay stuff between them in the video. It appears filming for the video would start at th that Thursday and Manson was just spurting out meaningless ideas in a joking manner that only makes sense to the both of them but it has to do with getting some people to recreate their formative years in a street opera. Whatever that means, it seems to be elaborated on by Manson in his Instagram post below from November 4th, 2017. Whatever this idea was, it was obviously discarded. Fanta is the favourite drink of Manson, as can be seen in this Instagram post. The word boom appears to be trademarked. <laughs> boom. We won't follow all of these links through because it will just make this video too long, but I did follow them and he does refer to these things. Of course, Manson had some wordplay and turns emoticons into emoticogs, which should be a working title for his street opera. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, so in the next set of texts, we have one that's redacted. Where are you? Is she there as well? This is Johnny Depp asking. Keep a distance and speak as little as possible to her. I get in car and comes to get you. I am at home, says Marilyn Manson. She's at sister's house. I should be cool here, but I got the cats, and they are rascals. Where are you, and where should I go? Because I don't have work today. I can hide out wherever you got my brother. At 7am on the same day, Manson then sends a now scrambled text, which includes the word restraining order. Depp then replies to Manson, stay away from Lindsay and speak as little as possible to her. With concern, Depp tells Manson, he would come and get him in his car. Manson quickly replies that he is safe at home with his cats while Lindsay is at a sister's house. Deb tells Manson that he is at his old mansion in West Hollywood. He invites him to come over, though he has a conference call. To what? To do drugs together? I am at the old house, old house 1496. I have a conference call in 40 minutes. I know sleeps. I know takey the drugs. Let's make noise. It says quite clearly he doesn't take the drugs, but he wants to make noise, which I presume is a reference to uh, jamming, as musicians would call it. And then Marilyn Manson replies, I talked to Tony, but this is fuck. She filed a restraining order, which we find out she didn't. She said I beat her up and gave the cops my address and said I have drugs here, so I am ready to book out of here. Manson says he talks to Tony, which is likely his manager, Tony Quiller, and seems to be receiving his information about Lindsay from him. We are then informed that Lindsay filed a restraining order against Manson and, said, and that he said he'd better up, gave the cops a copy of his address and said drugs were there because Manson doesn't want to deal with the cops in the situation. He wants to be with, with Depp at his place. It should be noted, Lindsay never did file a restraining order against Manson, nor has Lindsay claimed that Manson beat her. Either this was Lindsay making a threat to Manson, or Manson misunderstanding the situation from hearsay, or it is possible he is just playing up a situation for Depp. Whatever is the case, we do not have a clear idea of the situation from these texts without context. Manson says, do the call. I'll sneak over and make no noise and then hide. I got my guy Judd can drop me off after your call. I'm just packing up a few underwears and whatnot. And Depp says, don't worry about my call. 
Manson tells Depps to have his conference call and he will just sneak in and not make a noise. He says he will have his assistant, Justin Judd, Sherman, drop him off after his call. Meanwhile, he's packing up some underwear and things and Depp assures Manson to just come over despite the conference call. We now move forward in time, almost a year to November 2nd, 2017. When Manson tells Depp he now has crutches he could use that don't require the use of his hands and legs, and they could look uh, and they look like a pirate leg. So yeah, Manson actually did break a leg. Um, he does an interview about this particular incident um, when he broke his leg. So Manson's text reads, "I have a leg hands-free crutch. Looks like a pirate leg." He then text another message did that were approval get squared away so I can release the shit so we'll learn what that's about now um, this in reference to Manson's onstage accident in early October 2017 when he was required when he required surgery and needed a wheelchair and crutches to get around it is accompanied by a photo attachment I'm not sure why this text is in these documents but it stands alone for some reason the next day on november 3rd at 8 10 pm manson seems to be asking depp if he is approved to make a public statement in favor of depp's innocence and the reason we come to that conclusion is because of the following text i want to say this to the press or on twitter because it is real and i love my brother The next morning, Manson goes over his statement that he wants to make on behalf of Depp, whether through the press or on Twitter. However, this statement would not be released. Instead, he has made some other statement to the press in favour of Johnny, but it was in September of 2016. So, if this is in 2017, then I would say that it wasn't instead. <laughs> that, that he was only ever approved to give one statement, which was that one in 2016. Johnny Depp is by far the most caring person a wretch like me could ever know. He is selfless in his love of his close circle of true friends. He is a great, great father. And if anyone has the ignorance to compare his acting to paparazzi pictures, then you are tourists. <laughs> he invented paparazzi. Being real. Real fucking amazing. My best friend has never been afraid to be himself. He has known, and now I hope he is certain, that scabrous vultures are trying to eat at his unkillable corpse. <laughs> However, his artistic heart and God-given acting abilities go beyond film. He allows dim-witted doubters to assume his demise. That is his greatest gift, watching the rats jump ship and being a champion and looking handsome as fuck doing it. <laughs> I have to agree with Manson on all of those counts. I wanted to add that an actress he was involved with referred to me as a homosexual because Johnny and I have been friends for years and got matching tattoos. I thought it was an ironic joke, but I watched my best friend be called terrible slurs and I respect him as a gentleman for not saying the truth that I would love to tell the world. But as his friend and his daughter's godfather, I believe that family matters should be respected and not be a device to climb your way to the bottom. End this, but I won't unless you're against it. I fucking need to save this fucking landslide. I knew it was coming. That C-U-N-T. Okay, so now we do actually have an insult. <laughs> So, in two words, like really. One thing is certain in both cases between Manson's love life and Depp's love life, they both had each other's back strongly from the beginning and believed in each other's innocence, and they felt they were both going through something very comparable. More attachments were sent by Marilyn Manson. We don't know what this attachment is, but it seems to be a note or a drawing for Depp from Manson. 
We do know, however, that on this day Manson made the following Instagram post which depicted him from a scene from his music video that he did with Depp mentioned earlier, Kill For Me. Marilyn Manson, the first thing we shall do as brothers and mumblers and stammers is put them all in a hall of mirrors with an endless picture show of their forgotten childhoods. The senility of tourists fumbling through a world crafted by true geniuses, shamans, panderers of chaos and hanky-panky, pioneers with arrows in their backs. We are certainly not mature, and I speak of myself and my beloved best friend, but, 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 they are manure. <laughs> but they are manure. <laughs> that being said, stay tuned for the short film directed by uh, the Bill Yukic, it's called Kill For Me, starring Johnny Depp, Marilyn Manson, and the rest of and the rest of you will have to wait and see. I also pulled up this Instagram post by Lindsay. Two years ago we got married in our backyards with just five additional people present. It was exactly how we wanted to finally do it, and every moment I am thankful we did. The last these last two years have been so difficult externally. But our marriage is stronger for this and we are better human beings than we were the day before. I will never stop saying how much I love my husband. I will never stop fighting for the real truth and not one that's peddled to you through clickbait. <laughs> I completely agree, Lindsay. Clickbait bias headlines. I will never stop being excited to see what each new day, each new year will bring for us together. I love you, Angel. And so there it is, all of the texts that Amber Heard could not bring into the court trial. I don't think that there's anything damning in there. What do you think? Or do you think, as I do, that all these attempts to bring Marilyn Manson into the Depp versus Heard trial were an attempt to set things up for Manson's accusers and their upcoming trials.